Hello friends, and welcome back to Miss Shelved, your bi-weekly dose of bookstore love. I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley, here with another episode despite the sweltering heat in my apartment right now. For those of you new to the podcast, welcome. Every two weeks, I introduce you to an independent bookseller in conversation with an author they love. This week's bookseller is Jess Holleran. My name is Jess Holleran. I am the social media coordinator at Copper Dog Books. You might remember Copper Dog Books from season one, where Meg Wasmer, the co-owner, sat down in conversation with sci-fi fantasy author Martha Wells. Jess, at the time of this recording, was working at a different bookstore, but ended up jumping ship over to Copper Dog to run their social media and is doing a fantastic job. Jess is in conversation with the incredibly talented Susan Dennard. Hi, I am Susan Dennard, author of the Something Strange and Deadly series, as well as the currently ongoing Witchland series, the latest of which is called Witch Shoutout, just came out. I also host a popular writing newsletter for all those aspiring authors out there. Settle in as these two talk about book selling versus science, finishing writing things even if they're online, and Zutara, one of my personal favorite ships. I'm delighted we could do this. Yeah, this is awesome. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is non-linear career paths, because I think one of the main reasons I really love you as an author is that we both kind of came from science backgrounds and found our way into the world of books. So I kind of wanted you to talk about that and kind of how it all happened and basically figuring life out as you go. Did you tell me that you have a background in wildlife? I went to school for environmental science and I used to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service as a wildlife biologist. That's wild. Okay, so I mine is technically in fisheries science, so I also went to a fish and wildlife school in environmental science, <laughs> conservation. So that's crazy. Oh, okay. We would have been at the same like department if we went to the same school. I was initially in undergraduate and at the University of Georgia and was like, I'm going to get become a writer. I'm going to get a degree <laughs> in English because they did not have a creative writing program there at that time. E ages passed and I really didn't enjoy the English classes I had to take. I am not someone who is meant to really deeply analyze text, it would seem. And <laughs> so I ended up taking a marine biology class as just a, you had to have one science credit and fell in love. I loved it so much that by the end of my freshman year, I was switching over to that. And I moved into marine biology. And then <laughs> by the end of my sophomore year, I had discovered conservation and realized, like, I want to save the world from overfishing. <laughs> Not all heroes wear capes. <laughs> exactly. And so that's what I went into. <laughs> Through my undergraduate work, I was connected with a professor who invited me to join him in Canada, where he was going and where he was from originally to be his master's student. So that's what I did. I also have a minor in statistics. Data analysis was my groove. <laughs> and in some ways, could not be more different from writing. Yeah, so I, I ended up getting my master's in Canada. I worked in the Arctic for my research. Oh, that's so cool. Two different fields. It was literally cool. <laughs> 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 I worked in stabilized isotopes, which is chemistry, and which I remember absolutely none of. And then I worked in advanced what's called hierarchical modeling of ecosystems, which also I remember nothing of now. But that's what I did for a while. And then I ended up working sort of freelance in that because I met my husband, my boyfriend at the time. I with him overseas. And I could not get a job in fisheries in Germany. Understandable. I didn't speak German. Don't blame me. <laughs> Yeah, so I was doing like freelance data analysis for a while for my old university, which was not very fulfilling, to be honest. Part of the fun of being a scientist is being out in the field. <laughs> so yes. like just sitting at a computer analyzing someone else's fatty acid data was not fun. And I wasn't finding it particularly gratifying. And so I started writing again. I had taken a long pause from like being an avid fanfic writer in high school and oh my god, high. yes. Fanfic.net. <laughs> Oh my god, I tried to find my old like username and profile like yeah. a, a few uh, months ago because I was like, oh my god, I definitely wrote like a 53 chapter fanfic about like Naruto at one point and I was like, oh my <laughs> god, 
I yes. kind of want to go back to that and like look at how cringy it was. I definitely was also a fan fiction.net writer. My my name was Paige Turner, which I thought oh, was very nice. clever. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Because my middle name is Paige. Oh, even better. Don't remember my username and I'm sure my my, my profile and everything is probably still on there, but I am scared. <laughs> I'm scared to look. <laughs> <laughs> to uncover the archive. But yeah, so I was not very feeling particularly fulfilled with the data analysis, started writing again and decided to like actually study craft and study how the industry worked. I wrote one book. It was so bad, but I learned a lot. I took a lot of online workshops because of course I was in the middle of nowhere, Germany, and then wrote another book. It was also really bad, but I decided that <laughs> that was the book that was worth trying to make better. So I spent like a year reworking it, revising it, working with critique partners, and that is what ultimately became my debut, Something Strange and Deadly. That's awesome. That is so cool. It is It is really cool how like life kind of leads you in these paths and you don't necessarily see where they're leading at the moment, but then when you look back, you're like, oh my gosh, it all kind of all makes sense in the end. That's so weird. I absolutely agree. And I mean, I'm sorry, fish. I didn't save your populations, <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like I, I'm, I'm still doing good work putting, I feel like there's an environmental message in every one of my books. The Witchlands is secretly all about global climate change. Ha ha ha. <laughs> but the fish will have to find other scientists to protect them. I think, I think that's a very common goal or like ideology for people that enter the environmental field because I thought the same thing I was like I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna save the trees like yeah <laughs> single-handedly I am the Lorax you know <laughs> I kind of had a very similar path like in high school I went to an agricultural high school in Massachusetts and I majored in natural resources forestry and I really loved it and then when it came time for college I was looking at all different programs in forestry but you know college in America is like super pricey so so yeah. the only place that I could really afford was a paramilitary academy that had marine science. And I was like, hmm, these two things don't really seem to go together, but let me just try it. So wow. I went, yeah, it was really weird. But I went and obviously was not a huge fan of the paramilitary aspect, but yeah. really loved the marine science aspect and really like thrived being outside on the water and loving that. And then when I graduated, I did some ecological restoration work, fixing like old wetlands, turning them back into fully restored rivers, like removing wow. dams. It was That's it was awesome. really re rewarding stuff, but there was not a lot of like full-time careers yeah, in that field. Yeah. And then I moved to New Hampshire with my then partner and I couldn't find a full-time job in any environmental fields. And I was like, huh, what am I going to do? And so I started looking around and I found a bookstore called White Birch Books. At every job I had ever worked, I was always that nerd at lunch <laughs> who was reading. <laughs> and people would always be like, oh, are you, what are you reading? Like, what journal article? And I'm like, ew, like, why would I be reading scientific journal articles on my lunch break? Like, oh God, <laughs> I'm only going to be reading escapist fantasy here. And they'd just be like looking at me like, you're insane. And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. So I was always that person that like any, any, you know, spare minute I had, I was reading fantasy mostly and sci-fi. And then when I found that bookstore, I just walked in and was like, hey, I really want to work for you. I don't even know if you're hiring, but I'm here and I really want to work for you. And they were like, oh, okay. So that kind of just started it. And wow. I basically grabbed a job from nothing. <laughs> And then it turned into something wonderful and I learned so much about book selling and I, I now love this industry and I never want to leave. That's amazing. Yeah. And I really hope I never have to. And I also did not save the trees or the endangered rabbits <laughs> or the endangered birds that I was helping at one point. But, you know, there's going to be people out there that are going to do that. And hopefully I get to put the books in their hands that inspire them to do that. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating, too, because both wildlife biology and forestry and then fisheries is very male-dominated. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, pretty much every job I ever went into, obviously, the paramilitary academy I went to, there was, I think, 10% female population there so I think there were about 60 women in the entire college so it was pretty small 
it was definitely an interesting social experiment most of my life, <laughs> most of my life. But it is nice now to be around, you know, a lot of women for the first yeah. time in my life, which is really weird because I don't want to make it sound like I never was. Like I, I grew up with two sisters, so I didn't have any brothers, but I did have a lot of guy friends too. But yeah, like working with women is so drastically different in a lot of really good ways. I don't, you don't feel so much pressure to try to kind of, I don't know, act, act like a man, quote unquote. Absolutely. No, I Mm -hmm. absolutely understand because fisheries is the same. There were three women in my major with me (laughs) out of, I don't know, 50 to 60 people. (laughs) It was very, Mm -hmm. very male dominated and they definitely, there's a different energy. And like when you're in the field, they have to make accommodations for you. And it's always, you always feel like you're an inconvenience. Yes, that was a huge thing. I definitely did feel like, oh no, like, what if I have Mm -hmm. to use the bathroom? I'm five miles out in the middle of a salt marsh. Like, what do I do? I did have a really great boss at one of my jobs who was a male and he was like very conscious of certain things that like I needed that were different and like really tried to like help me plan around those things. But I did also have bosses in other jobs that were very male dominated that like just didn't really care. And yeah, we, you know, obviously if you're doing field work, regardless of the type of field work, like you're going to get dirty. And yeah. I thought it was really interesting at one of my jobs how, like, the guys could wear, like, polos and khakis, and they were like, you know, you should really wear a blouse. And I was like, why? Because I was like, I'm going to get covered in, like, stinky water. (laughs) This doesn't really make any sense. And there were other jobs, too, that I had where they told me to dress, quote unquote, like, more professionally as a woman, which I thought was, like, really odd. And now I realize, like, as a non-binary person, that that's why I thought it was odd, because I was like, I've never dressed like a woman before in my life. Wow, <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I, I'm, I guess most people do classify me as a girl, but yeah, I like, I've never, I've never really conformed to that. Really? Even, like, when I was at the military academy, and they, you know, gave me skirts and stuff to wear I always always wore pants you know so I don't know it was just it was just really interesting like looking back at it I'm like that's why I didn't understand and I also didn't understand because it was sexist but like (laughs) like, yeah I, I also didn't understand because like I never felt the need to conform that way like personally so now it all makes sense <laughs> yeah definitely but yeah I'm glad I'm glad we both ended up where we ended up and it's definitely very refreshing to be around people who just kind of accept you for who you are and don't try to change you and play to your strengths and it's wonderful yeah the book industry has its definite flaws although it's grown a lot since I first went into it but it's definitely a far more welcoming place than I found science to be. I don't want to generalize, obviously. Like, none of what I'm saying is is obviously 100% fact. But yeah, for, for the most part, I find myself as like a more friendly, kind of like outgoing, sociable person. And when faced with a room with scientists who were mostly like all about the data and not really about the like socialization aspect, I always felt really weird because I'm like, am I just supposed to be a robot that like fits out data? Like, is that what my purpose is? (laughs) It's definitely nice to be around people who have a little bit more personality. (laughs) We express our feelings. Yes, exactly. We're more outspoken about the things we like and we actually want to talk about things. And it is, it's a breath of fresh air as far as that. What things have you started watching, reading, consuming during the pandemic that are like comfort things or what things have been your comfort reads or watches or plays? It's funny because the pandemic, I have not done much reading because I had a baby and then had a deadline. <laughs> so I, my reading is embarrassing. I miss it, but it's also like there is time in the day to write or write. I will say like in terms of show that I've been, I love and I was really glad to pick back up was The Expanse. Have you watched The Expanse? Oh my gosh, I'm, so I just started that. I'm on episode ah! seven of the oh first season and it's so good. Isn't it? 
I so yeah. that and I'm like we're going really slow on the final season because I'm so sad it's over. But I think I'm just gonna start rewatching it as soon as it ends. It's it's really really good, especially oh my gosh season two ah oh, it's my favorite. I so, can't wait because so many people have been telling me to watch it for so long, and then when I started it, I was like, this is amazing. This is everything I've ever wanted in a sci-fi show. <laughs> yeah, it's like filled the whole Battlestar left behind, and in some ways I like it more because it in some ways can make fun of itself like it doesn't take itself too seriously mm -hmm. so i i just i really which i feel like the witchlands is that way that's definitely the way i write and the way i like things so so good i'm glad you're watching yeah it. <laughs> i know i'm definitely gonna fly through it now that i know that it's even more worth it in season two so <gasps> thank you very much for the tip yeah i've been i've definitely been gravitating back towards a lot of like shows and movies and just things that bring me comfort. Like I rewatched Avatar The Last Airbender oh last year when gosh. I got on Netflix. It is one of the greatest kids TV shows that can also be watched by adults. Like Absolutely. it is just iconic and the character arcs are so well done. Like it's just inspiring to watch because I'm like, if I could write a character arc this good, like as, as far as Zuko goes, I'm like, oh my God. Like he just has such a good like redemption story. I agree. Zuko is my, he's the one I point to as like probably the best character arc out there. Certainly yes. for an anti-hero type character. Yes. And I love me some good anti-heroes, for sure. In your books, I, I kind of love Aedwin, even though he's like, I guess kind of not, I don't know. I don't know if he's technically considered an anti-hero anymore, but I just love him. I love him so much. He is my baby. I would die for him. <laughs> Every time I read him, when I read Blood Witch, I was like, yes, Aedwin. I was so excited to read from his perspective. You have feelings. You do. I do have so many feelings about Aedwin. Oh, my God. I mean, Zuko was definitely someone who inspired not necessarily just him i feel like I, there's a little bit of zuko in every character in the witchlands and every character mm -hmm. i probably will ever write just because it really is such a nuanced story and, and ang is great i love ang but zuko <laughs> yeah it's funny because like i mean yeah i love ang too i just think he's like a sweet cinnamon roll of a child who you yeah. need to protect at all costs but Zuko is just so good because like he's really not perfect and I feel like sometimes end up thinking that Aang is like a perfect person because he is like the monk that like we must not harm anyone and you know yeah. he's always like making friends and Zuko you know he just he has a lot of anger and he has a lot of emotions and yeah. it's just it's just insane sometimes like watching it and being like I can relate so much to like his pain and like you know when he realizes like he has a choice and he kind of like goes down a path that he's never gone down like you're just so proud of him watching it you're oh, like, yes, I know. Zuko. yes finally it, Zuko we oh, knew it was in you we knew exactly. we saw that we spark. always believed in you we were always rooting for him and yes Zuko and Katara forever forever forever, forever. absolutely mm -hmm. agree absolutely yeah. definitely it's sold an age when it's like my answer to my frustrations <laughs> of Zatara yes oh my gosh I need to read the comics still because now when I see them in the bookstore I'm like can I just take a four hour lunch break and read all of these <laughs> because I still haven't read them and I really I haven't either I need to read the Kiyoshi yeah. warrior ones because I know that I would love those the other things I've been watching my family my sisters and I used to have a tradition every year to watch Lord of the Rings together on like a week-long vacation but obviously because of COVID we didn't go on our family vacation this year so we have just been comfort watching Lord of the Rings whenever things get too hard so nice. I think like last year we watched it about three times <laughs> like all wow. of, every single movie wow does that include yeah. the Hobbit no not not the Hobbit ones only the that's Lord good of the Rings ones. they're not very good yeah. they're an utter mm. disappointment <laughs> yeah yeah exactly like like, I think the Lord of the Rings just have a lot of nostalgia for us. And um, yeah. I just, uh, Frodo and Sam forever. I love them. <laughs> and then I've also been watching Studio Ghibli. I've been watching a lot of their movies. I just watched like Howl's Moving Castle. And I just watched Spirited Away again. I think Spirited Away is my favorite from them. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I don't know. Just something about that story gets me, gets me every mm -hmm. time. It's so atmospheric too. Like watching yeah. it, you're just like so caught up in that world, and it's just yeah. so beautiful and like terrifying at the same time. And it's like 
I love showing people that one if they've never seen any of the others because they're like, what is this fever dream? And I'm like, it's wonderful, isn't it? And they're like, oh my God, I'm so confused. And I'm like, it doesn't have to make sense. It's just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're more up on media. I feel like the pandemic just shut me down. Well, that and then having a baby. <laughs> and all the energy I have has to go into writing. And I find when I'm drafting Witchlands, I cannot read anything complicated mm -hmm. because so much brain power goes into that book into those books they're just so complicated i look forward to the day when i'm done with the series so that i can pick up books that are mentally challenging again because fantasy is difficult to read it requires an yeah. engagement from the reader that other books maybe don't you have to keep track of names you have to keep track of histories and character connections and i love that stuff it is my bread and yeah. butter growing up but i have found since writing the witchlands that i really struggle to actually read it and i think it's just because my brain is so dead from making it oh I think that makes a hundred percent sense because your plots are just so detailed and so wonderfully like planned out and I mean the readers definitely appreciate it so your work does get noticed and yeah it, it is it's absolutely like amazing to like be immersed in your world because it it is it's like a full immersion that totally makes sense and I hope that you do find like a brain candy option for you yeah I'm I I mean I will say, like, the thing I can read without fail is nice historical romance. You know what's going to happen. You know when it's going to happen. Beautiful, it's, yeah. Uh, it's just, it's, they're short. I've, and I, this is no shade on that genre. I love that genre. I could never write that genre. But it's, it's easy for me to read. And especially during the pandemic, it was like, give me the comfort of knowing they would fall in love every time. I totally understand that. I also have been reading a few more romance novels than usual. They're usually like fantasy romance. There's some that I've yeah. read that aren't coming out until like November. But yeah, I like, I really do enjoy a good historical romance. And I didn't realize that until the pandemic. And I was like, yeah. I've never read these. And now I'm like, oh, they are beautiful and wonderful and so gorgeously <laughs> like atmospheric and again, yeah, it yes. just transports you completely. It's mm -hmm. good for pandemic when you need just, you just need something nice. <laughs> you just need yeah, something exactly. safe. <laughs> exactly. Like any, any spare serotonin that I can get from, <laughs> from a exactly. book, I'm like, please shower yes. it upon me. So I wanted to also talk to you about your luminary Sue's Your Own Adventure, because I thought <laughs> that was the smartest thing that I've ever seen Twitter be used for. And I was just, like oh my gosh how did she come up with the idea to do this and it was just so wonderful and you saved all of us from ourselves when we made really dumb choices <laughs> to, to anyone who doesn't know the luminaries was a choose your own adventure story on twitter that susan kind of like planned out and made all of her followers vote on which direction the story was going in and it happened was that two years ago now yeah, because it, it started a year before our baby was born, the same day she was born, just a year earlier. Oh. So yeah, it's been like a year and a half, a little over a year and nine months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that was that was a really fun ride. And I just I just wanted to know, like, how did you come up with <laughs> storytelling in that medium? Because I, mean, I just thought that was so brilliant. I mean, you're a gamer, right? And yes. I'm a gamer. And the fun of gaming which speaking of, that's another medium I still do consume. <laughs> but I, as a gamer, like the fun of it is that you have agency, right? You get to choose what you're going to do. And even when with like really linear stories, you still feel like you're the one driving it. And so I, I don't know. That's sort of what happens too, I guess, in a choose your own adventure book. I wasn't really thinking of it that way. When I first sat down, I was literally sitting in LaGuardia waiting on a plane after BookCon, what was that, 2019? And I had, had a miscarriage that year. I was in a dark place. It was a hard year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I was just like, this will be fun. It'll probably go nowhere, but let's just see what happens. And then, bam, <laughs> it did not go nowhere. People got, <laughs> they got really big and, and became a lot bigger than I anticipated. Not a bad thing by any means. It just took took up a lot more time than I was planning, but it was also so fun for me, for everyone involved, because 
you know, I was kind of making up the story as we went along. I had a general framework to go by and I had a world that I had already built and tried to sell in 2013 with no success. Yeah, it was, it was really fun escapism. It really helped me when I was going through a not great time and it ended up lasting a little over six months. I think it was like six months and a week or so before we all finally reached the end. <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely like... I didn't really use Twitter that often before that, and when that started happening, I was like, oh my god, I need to see the next part of the story, I need to vote, <laughs> like, I would I would be checking it constantly, and I found myself only checking it to vote on your story, like, I was like, I need to know what's gonna happen to Winnie, like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be stressful. And stupid Jay, I was like, oh, Jay. It was great. It, like, actually made me check Twitter. So oh, thank, thank you, you. Because I, I definitely never really checked Twitter before. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I really do need to know what happens. So I hope that – is that one <laughs> turning into an actual book? Like, Yeah, I mean, I feel like I can say this since by the time this podcast does come out. Yes, it will officially be a book. I'm not entirely sure when it's coming out, but hopefully – Hopefully within the next year or two. I have written the book. I'm actually like probably going to turn it into my editor next week. It's interesting. So when I sat down to write it, I was like, I want to stay true to what happened, to what my original vision was. And I realized that I couldn't. Like there's no way to tap into that because what made it fun was the format. You know, there's mm -hmm. no way, there's absolutely no way I could mimic that story or, or like try to align the events of a book to it and have the same mm -hmm. magic. So what I ended up doing after a few false starts and tossed words. It's the same world, it's the same cast of characters, but it's a definitely a different story. There's lots of homage moments to the Twitter venture, you know, some boops. <laughs> and <laughs> like, there's a locket, there's lots of things that are familiar, but I definitely wanted it to feel fresh for all the people who actually, you know, played in the game that we had going. You'll know some spoilers that the average reader won't. Like some of some of the surprise bad guys, so to speak, quote unquote. Are mm -hmm. they ever really bad? Yeah, I'm I'm really excited for people to to read it and get back into it. Because it was so fun. I don't know. There's it's it really that world has such a special place for me and I hope well, it sounds like lots of people. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of people love that. And yeah, it was so interactive and so fun. And I'm looking forward to it being different just because I think it's going to be fun. It's going to be a little surprise. And I think that's great. The other thing that I stumbled upon was your Wattpad story three. Yeah. Oh, my God. That is one of my favorite, like, young adult horror, like, stories I've ever read. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, are you going to continue to write that? Like, do you have any plans to continue to write that? That was amazing, and I definitely really loved it. Yeah, so The Executioner's 3 is on Wattpad. It's basically right up to the climax, and then I leave everyone hanging, mostly because my life completely imploded, and I had to stop working on anything years ago. Oops, sorry. That's <laughs> but okay. But it, it's set in 1999, and it's about a girl named Freddie who fancies herself a, an amateur amateur sleuth and there are some gruesome murders happening in her town and she's essentially trying to get to the root of what's going on but there's definitely some paranormal supernatural elements to it because there's a local legend about some executioners who used to live there and when they would arrive to kill people and of course then there's the there's the rival prep school nearby with the hot dude who has to show up and be the rival enemy in their ongoing prank war so yes, there's a lot happening in that book, and it was really fun to write. I wrote it during a hard time in my life. I started in vitro fertilization, and things were not going well. And I actually started that book many, many years ago, and it just would work on it every fall a little bit. And it kept kind of changing shape until it reached the shape that it is now, and I wrote it all in a flurry of ins escapist inspiration during this tough time. And then... I guess that's when my miscarriage happened and I just shut down and I stopped working on it. I definitely want to finish it. it I know what happens, you know? <laughs> the question is really where and how. That's the thing my agent and I are kind of working on because it's amazing to have had it on Wattpad and I hate leaving people hanging, but at the same time, I need to eat. <laughs> so right. no, if I can that sell is totally it, totally understandable. <laughs> then that's what I would like to do and, you know, finish it for an actual paycheck. But it was also super, super fun to to write it, 
again, during a hard time, I, a lot of these things, Executioner's Three Luminaries were done when I needed to escape. And mm-hmm. I'm really proud of it. I love it. I think it's the funniest thing I've ever written. It's a lot of humor and atmospheric. And yeah, I'm so I'm so pleased you like it. That really makes me happy. It's, it's most people don't even know it exists, you know. So I I know me. I don't even remember how I found it, but I was like I basically was I've like read a, read your books a bunch, and I was like I I need something else from her, and I was like I'm going <laughs> to find anything that she's written, and then I found the Wattpad, and I was like oh my gosh this is wonderful. So yeah, I mean it definitely I think a lot of people would really love it. There's one more thing I want to talk about, and it. The Witchland series adaptation. So it your Witchland series just got optioned for Netflix? Oh no, not Netflix, but it was so it was actually optioned a while ago by Jim Henson Studios. So that was like two thousand it's been a while, two thousand seventeen. It was a while before we could even announce it either, just because Hollywood moves very slowly. So they have been developing it slowly. I can't share too much beyond the fact that we have a team of sister writers who are the showrunners. Which I love that they're sisters. Nothing could be That's more awful. appropriate. And then our director is a trans, non-binary director, artist. Mm-hmm. They are just, I, I hate to sound super gushy because I'm a professional, but they're amazing. <laughs> uh, they and the Bensons. Um, so we have Julie and Shauna Benson, who are the showrunners, and then Alice Waddington, who is the the uh, director for the pilot and potentially whatever else might come. And they just have, the, the group collectively just has this amazing vision. I really love it. They've tried really hard to respect the source material, which I appreciate so much. And I, yeah, I just, I feel like it's in the best possible hands. And Henson is so, you know, it's a quirky, quirky company the the art that they create the puppets the the cgi I'm they so do excited. there's a there's a there's a look a style that's uniquely henson and it's funny because or not funny but it's it's helpful in some ways because it's not at all how i envision the witchlands but i love it so it allows me to distance myself emotionally in some ways like like i'm not i don't feel wrapped up in things in a way if they decide they need to change the story mm-hmm. you know you guys are already translating this into this totally new medium and TV film is so different from, from, you know, novels. So oh, I, yeah, I mean, I could not be in better hands over there and I hope, eh, you know, that's all I can share at this point, but hopefully we have cool things to share soon. <laughs> yeah, that's really exciting. And I really think that there isn't a lot of, like really great like book to TV series adaptations for young adult fantasy. So like, I'm really excited. I think it's going to be awesome. So we're almost out of time. So I guess it's time to wrap things up. So again, I'm Jess. You can find me at Jesse Holleran. That's J-E-S-S-I-H-O-L-L-E-R-A-N. That's on Instagram. My website is jesshollerinwrites.com. I have a bunch of book reviews there. And my Twitter handle is holla. It's J-E-S-S-H-O-L-L-L-A. Because I have to be extra. I'm pretty easy to find. I'm at stdennard, D-E-N-N-A-R-D, basically everywhere. And I think even on Wattpad, you can search for me and find me there. Since we were talking about it. Saint Denard, <laughs> even though I say my last name Denard. And then I have a newsletter, which you can find on my website, susandenard.com. And you can get all the latest updates on my books, but also monthly insights and advice on writing right now. And we close the chapter on another episode. If you liked it, and we hope you do, don't forget to subscribe and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, we're on them all. If you really like what we do, you can support us by following on Instagram and Twitter at MissShelvedPod. Early access to episodes, as well as lots of other cool perks, are available over at my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash N-E Brinkley. We'll be back with another episode for you in two weeks. Until then, happy reading!